Okay, I think everybody has transitioned over. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are Zooming in from. Today's seminar will be by Russell Bicknell from the American Museum of Natural History in the United States. Uh, and he will be talking about modeling predatory anthropods using virtual paleobiological tools. Before we get started with today's seminar, just a few quick announcements. Hopefully my computer also behaves, it's a little slow, uh, but yeah, okay. So we're very excited, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, PaleoPerks values the participation of all folks. Um, please remember to abide by a code of conduct. If you are zooming in, it means you have gone through the code of conduct. Um, so hopefully everybody abides by it. You should be muted. Uh, for some reason, if you find yourself to be unmuted, please mute yourself so that Russell can give a undisturbed seminar. Any questions that you have can be um, sent to questions at PaleoPerks host, who today is going to be Elizabeth. Or you can use the raise hand function. At the end of the seminar, we will unmute you and you can directly ask Russell your question. Any technical issues that you face during the seminar should also go to the questions at PaleoPerks host. We do have Zoom uh, captions, so you can use the CC button to show or hide them. You will find two links in the Zoom chat. One of them is for nominating an early career researcher to give a talk at PaleoPerks, and the other one is a anonymous, optional, and highly encouraged weekly feedback form. Uh, you will find both of them in the chat. With that, we are very excited to have Russell. Uh, he did his bachelor's and master's at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, both of them in geosciences, followed by a paleobiology PhD at the University of New England in Australia. He also did a postdoc there. He is currently a postdoctoral research and teaching fellow at the American Museum of Natural History. And with that, Russell, feel free to take over the Zoom screen share and tell us all about trilobites. Okay, thank you very much. Let's get this going. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Yeah. All right. So yes, thank you all for I suppose coming to the Zoom today. And it's my pleasure to talk to you all about some of the fun and funky research that I've been doing over the last seven years in which I've tried to use an array of three-dimensional tools to kind of tackle questions within arthropod paleobiology to understand things like predator groups. So why do we care about predation. Well, predation is thought to be, generally thought to be a, a pretty serious driver in terms of evolution. And the rise of different predator groups has thought to have either kickstarted or really accelerated an array of ecological events over, over deep time. Uh, this includes things like the Cambrian explosion, uh, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, the Siluro-Devonian Jaw Armament, as well as the rise of um, ne uh, planktonic animals within the Devonian, and then the armament of fish, and then, of course, into more recent Mesozoic dinosaurs. Beyond that, though, predators are pretty awesome, and we can look at an array of their morphologies that we see in the fossil record to understand how they've been so successful. So how do we look at predation within invertebrates in general? Well, we can look at injuries in exoskeletons. So this is a trial bite here that's got some spines that are no longer there. That may have been a molting complication or it may have been predation. We can look at drill holes. We've got a couple of examples over there, drilled shelly things. We look at coprolites, so uh, the remains of, of fossil poop. An example down there from uh, the Emu Bay Shale in Australia, which has some trilobite fragments in it. And we can look at gut contents. So this is a really exceptional specimen of, of Sydney and expectance from the Burgess Shale. So this is a close-up of what's in this animal's guts, showing us that this animal was eating some kind of shelly organisms. Usually, we need exceptional preservation to observe these sorts of interactions. Uh, and really, almost ironically, the more informative the specimen is, the rarer it is. So I think there's like maybe five specimens of Sydney uh, 
uh, in the Berger Shower, which is, of course, beautifully preserved, that has these sorts of information. So, and it's kind of annoying. So we're often limited to looking at biomineralized prey and the results of either failed predation or successful drilling predation. But what if, we, what if we change the narrative? What if we look at predators as opposed to the prey items themselves? As I mentioned before, there's a lot of really cool apex predators, especially within arthropods, that arose over the Phanerozoic. So when we're talking about this sort of application, we're thinking in three dimensions. And arthropod paleobiology over the last five years, five, 10 years, has seen a really amazing acceleration in terms of what we can do. So building off over a century to two centuries worth of functional morphological considerations, we're now able to examine our arthropods in three dimensions. We're able to look at them, we extract them from rock, we're able to understand how they can move, how they can function. And this framework is actually really, really ideal for understanding predator groups. So we've got this really nice shift in how we are looking at predators. And this aligns with what's happening within vertebrate paleontology. So how do we do these sorts of things? Well, usually there's some kind of scanning tool that's involved. So micro or CT scanning, uh, neutron scanning, so chucking the fossil in a nuclear reactor, uh, or synchrotron scanning, so this is the, the Melbourne synchrotron, that's basically a high-powered micro CT. Um, we can reconstruct the animal, so if we can't scan it, if it's too pancaked or just isn't going to work, uh, we can use paleo artistry to build the animal in 3D, and usually there's some degree of high-powered computing that goes on. Off the back of those methods, we have four main, I suppose, approaches that we then, I'm gonna really be talking about that I've used. So segmentation and reconstruction, so working with those scans to build the animal, uh, biomechanics, uh, kinematics, how things move, and computational fluid dynamics. What happens if you put something in a computational flume hood? So segmentation and reconstruction is basically, this is, the, the bare bones what's required to do everything else that I'm going to be talking about today. The work that I've done, I've looked at both modern and, and fossil forms. So this is a scorpion here, and I've looked at segmented skin and segmented the muscles in that scorpion. Uh, this is part of a dinosaur, and this is a horseshoe crab. When we're doing, when we're scanning and reconstructing animals, we are given some really good insight into the internal structures that we're seeing. That we can't often observe on the surface of the fossil. Um, and this avoids us having to do things like histology and more destructive approaches for lack of a better description. The majority of the approaches I've used for scanning reconstruction are, are involved a program called Materialized Mimics, although there is an array of softwares out there that people have been using over the last 10 years. Thinking now about, so with that framework there, we'll think about biomechanics. So two-dimensional biomechanics uh, presented a really core insight into how animals function, um, how things move relative to other segments, um, and how different parts of an experience force. The last two decades saw a transition from two-dimensional considerations, so some examples here, to the third dimension. And so once you open up that possibility. There's a whole host of analyses and considerations that we can make in that framework. And in my view, it allows for a more complete understanding of the animal in general. The tool that's most commonly used for 3D biomechanics is called finite element analysis, FEA. And FEA originally was designed as an engineering tool to understand effectively the limits on a structure. So if you build a tower, uh, where is this tower likely to uh, collapse if it experiences an earthquake? There has been a really nice synthesis between this engineering aspect and, and biology and paleontology to produce three-dimensional biomechanics. This method allows us to understand where a model, our three-dimensional construction, will experience stress and strain under specified conditions such as muscles and restraints, points of rotation, and allows us to understand how morphologies deform under these conditions. 
the majority of applications of this method have been within the realm of vertebrates. So the majority of examples here are things that have uh, endoskeletons. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing has been trying to pull our consideration of arthropods in line with where the vertebrate realm is currently at, which is really exciting. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of work that I've done in this context. So we're going to start with trilobites because trilobites are amazing. Trilobites are related groups, things called artiopodans. Trilobites are probably the most common arthropod in the fossil record, maybe except for insects, but they're probably the most well known. And they preserve really well because they, their dorsal exoskeleton is made effectively of rock, which means that they are you know, like shells. They preserve really well within the fossil record. Very occasionally, though, we get the appendages preserved. So this is a couple of examples of appendages. So this is um, Olenoides serratus from the aforementioned uh, Burgess Shale. These are the leg sections there. And this is Red Ledger Rex from the Emu Bay Shale. These appendages look pretty similar to appendages of horseshoe crabs. And so it's been proposed that these animals were capable of crushing shells, at the very least, you know, eating with these sorts of structures. And so I was able to actually address this particular topic using FEA. So when we are going to step into doing some kind of finite element analysis, we need to have our null model. We need to have a thing we can say, well, this is a modern analog that we think our animal probably functions like. And so in this case, we chose horseshoe crabs. Some lovely horseshoe crabs there. Um, in this case, because we actually have horseshoe crab specimens, they're three-dimensional, we can put them in a micro CT scanner. This is what I've done there, I scanned the leg. And so from there, we can also determine where the muscles are, that are used in mastication are. So these little aspects here, these are our drawings of the muscles that we assume are probably going to be in our fossil animals as well. So these are one of the assumptions that we need to make. Don't make these assumptions, the models don't run or they don't make sense. The flip side of things, looking at the fossils, is these animals are preserved as two-dimensional impressions. They're basically pancakes. And so no matter how hard you try, scanning this is not going to work particularly well. So we needed to reconstruct them in 3D. So by looking at the fossils and comparing them in different orientations where possible, we're able to build these sorts of three-dimensional models we see down here that we can then analyze. In this case, when I, before I ran, built our models, I scaled all of our reconstructions, our fossil reconstructions to the size of our horseshoe crab, just because it allows us to have a more one-to-one -one comparison in this case. And using our horseshoe crab uh, base model there and comparing it to our fossil things, I was able to build these models in strand, in which case I assigned uh, muscle orientations, muscle sizes based on our modern horseshoe crabs, and then indicated where the model should be constrained. So in this case, we know that horseshoe crabs use these little teeth here um, for the chewing, so we constrain those points, and we know that they rotate about this point in the appendage, and we effectively did the same thing for our trilobites, making the assumptions that trilobites probably function the same way that horseshoe crabs do. What does this all do? Well, it produces a really nice array of pretty, pretty colors. Um, it allows us to see where the stress and strain distributions of trilobites, um, these two here, uh, artiopodans, this is Sydney and expectants I mentioned beforehand, um, and horseshoe crabs um, in the models. And we can see that where our horseshoe crabs uh, and Sydney have a very similar sort of color distribution, stress strain distribution, which tells us that Sydney is probably similar to horseshoe crabs in terms of how it can crush shell, which makes sense because we've seen examples of Sydney with shells in the gut content. Looking at uh, Red Litra Rex here and Olenoides serratus, though, there's a lot of blue. This tells us that there's limited stress strain experience through the model. And we think that for Red Litra, this indicates a, a more effective construction for shell crushing because it's got little stout spines there and it really does look like a nutcracker of, of an appendage. Uh, Olenoides, on the other hand, has these really long spines, these little elongate structures there. And we think that the majority of the stress is actually taken up in those spines. And so if this animal were to try and tackle, say, some kind of shelly organism, like another trilobite, it probably would have experienced 
failure um, along those spines. So this gives us some really good insight into what was doing predation at the Cambrian, a really important period of time in which life was really taking off. My second example today is sea scorpions. I, I love sea scorpions because they are amazing large arthropods. They're really what happens when you just, you, you take, you take an arthropod and you just push it to its logical extreme and you get two and a half meter long beasts. And they have these really, really amazing uh, modified chillus racer, anteriorly directed grabbing structures. These look very similar to scorpion pincers. And so it means that we had a really ideal comparison to understand scorpions versus our sea scorpions. The construction for this approach was slightly modified from what I did with our trilobites and our horseshoe crabs. Once again, we start with our null model. Our null model is that sea scorpions probably function like scorpions. And from there, we scan, I said, scanned a bunch of scorpion pincers uh, and had worked with colleagues across the world who'd previously done similar work. Our sea scorpions, on the other hand, we needed to reconstruct again, because similarly to trilobite appendages, sea scorpions to rate are, for the most part, preserved as, as two-dimensional impressions. So scanning is not really going to work so well. Now, as opposed to scaling uh, the trilobite models to the size of the horseshoe crab, which is what I did previously, in this case, we actually used our scorpion muscle, uh, scorpion models and muscle sizes to predict how forceful our sea scorpion pincing force would have been. And the reason we did this is because we don't want to scale our two and a half meter long beast down to the size of a scorpion. Um, there are complications that arise from that. And ultimately it's not a very uh, realistic representation of these sorts of animals. Uh, other than that though, the rest of the process was the same. Um, scan, reconstruct, work in mimics, uh, sorry, uh, work in the strand and then resulting models. So we have our scorpions and our sea scorpion models here. So what's really funky with this is we were able to look at scorpion groups as well as our sea scorpion groups and then compare and contrast between the two, the fossil and the modern. And so because we had so many different morphologies in scorpions, we had an ideal range that we could compare to. And we see that in generally speaking, that the stress strain distributions in our scorpions is similar to our sea scorpions. So this probably was a pretty good choice of a comparative model there, which is ideal. We were also able to then focus in on our sea scorpions to understand what those different morphologies actually represent and what they mean in the context of stress and strain. So we can see here we've got uh, forms with more elongate spines here that probably were less effective at really dealing with reinforced prey, especially um, the cute ramus over here, which has really inclined serrated morphology that we can see that areas of high stress there would have really experienced some, some pain if it were to try and grab down on something a little more reinforced. Uh, by comparison, uh, Yakelopterus, yes, that is the two and a half meter long uh, animal has generally lower stress, a lot more blue along the model, telling us that this animal was a lot more reinforced with those lovely stout spines, meaning it was probably more effective at targeting uh, prey items that were more reinforced. Now, finite element models produce a ton of data. Like they really do make a lot of data. I'm showing you figures, but th that's based on a lot of information. And so we can actually pull this data out and more further contextualize our models and our animals. So this is what I've done here. I've looked at um, the vomitus stress. That, that's effectively an overall measure of how much, how blue or how red our model is. And I've looked at um, the volume of our model. So how, how much space our models actually show. And what we can see is that as your animals increase in size, so as you get to that two and a half meter long interval, you are you generally experience lower stress and therefore you're more effective at using these structures at grabbing and dealing with prey, which is really quite cool. And finally, we can think about these animals in the context of phylogeny. And so we can see that, or phylogeny in time. And so we can see that as we move towards Silurian and Devonian, we're moving towards modern day, there's a transition away from these sorts of, I suppose, more inclined morphologies and into a more stout-like structure that we see in Pterygotus and Yakelopterus, 
this could be associated with the rise of armored fish and then a transition for sea scorpions sort of to be more effective predators dealing with those sorts of prey. All right, so let's put biomechanics aside for a second, think about kinematics. Kinematics is effectively a method that allows us to understand how structures move relative to each other. Uh, intrinsically, it's therefore related to biomechanics, but it focuses more on motion, how things move, as opposed to the forces things can experience. The majority of work that's been done with kinematics has once again been in the two-dimensional, but a modern shift to 3D also within the vertebrate realm has allowed us to start thinking about these animals, animals in general, in that bigger context, which is really exciting. So work that I've been doing with colleagues across the globe has started to look at 3D kinematics of arthropods. And in particular, we're looking at things like chelicerates, things with large raptorial anteriorly directed grabbing appendages. We've got C spar, excuse me. Uh, we've got a couple of chelicerates here with those large, large grabbing appendages. And we can also look at, so we can look at how they move, and we can also look at the walking legs of these animals. We can look at how they these animals are able to walk and compare them to both modern, other modern forms and also specimens, species in the fossil record where possible. So how do you build a kinematic model? Well, once again, you start with your null mole consideration. So if we want to look at something that has a large grabbing appendage in the fossil record, we want to look at some in the modern day that does have that. And so examples that I showed you there are of some arachnids that have those large anteriorly directed grabbing appendages. We scan usually our model um, because allowing that allows us to then segment out those main different exoskeletal segments and then to understand the possible range of motion that this structure, this animal could actually experience. Generally speaking, we'll have to reconstruct our fossil model, similar problems as before with our biomechanics. These animals are often preserved as two-dimensional impressions, which limits how much we can scan. And then we'll build our kinematic marionettes. So that what that means is basically, this is what this pathway is showing you here. We'll build that step by step. This is what will move relative to the next subsequent part of the exoskeleton. And by rotating these different segments, as we're doing here, we'll be able to figure out the full range of motion for the entire appendage. Uh, in this case, the software that was used was Autodesk Maya, although I think you can now do it in Blender as well, which is really cool, and also open access and free. So let's think about a couple of examples here. I'm going to first look at walking legs, and then we're going to look at those grabbing appendages, sort of thinking about those large arthropods once again, the fossil record. So sea scorpions, eurypterids, uh, some of them have these large anteriorly directed grabbing appendages. Some of those have those large chelicerae that we saw before. And they also have walking legs. So this is a reconstruction of the walking legs of uh, Eurypterus, probably the most iconic uh, sea scorpion. And we compared this to the walking legs of horseshoe crabs. This is also pushing legs of horseshoe crabs as well, because we kind of figured that at least horseshoe crabs and sea scorpions are related to each other. And it's been proposed that these animals probably did walk functionally similar to horseshoe crabs. And what these models show you is that our horse crabs have a lot more range of motion. They can do a lot more with their walking legs and their pushing legs than sea scorpions, our Eurypterus, can. And so this really aligns with the more pelagic life mode that we think our Eurypterus had. So swimming around as opposed to scuttling on the sea floor. Then thinking about our these large anteriorly directed grabbing appendages using those arachnids as the uh, modern analog once again, we can see that there's a similar range of motion from fully outstretched to effectively fully enclosed, developing what's called a, a capture basket. And so we've got these, these Ordovician animals, really, when sea scorpions were just starting to really take off, having very effective means of capturing and then processing prey that is effectively being replicated in modern arachnids. 
Okay, so the last method that I'm going to talk to you about today is computational fluid dynamics. This is sort of the frontier of my work. CFD allows you to build a virtual flume tank. So effectively, you can look at how fluid will deform uh, around a structure that you plonk in this plume tank. And once again, it has been primarily used within engineering. It's been recently synthesized with, with paleobiology to more completely understand animals. So people have used it to look at arthropods. Um, and so these are some trilobites down here, but really the, the application within arthropods has been quite limited. So what am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to look at CFD to understand how and why so many arthropods end up looking like horseshoe crabs, my favorite group of animals of all time. So we've got an array of examples here. So that's a horseshoe crab. Um, that's a trilobite. That's an artiopodon that was around about the same time as uh, so during the Cambrian. And this is triopsis, our one of modern day uh, crustaceans that kind of looks like a horseshoe crab. And so some of the questions I'm looking to address with this basically understand like, why do arthropods converge that live in marine environments converge on a horseshoe crab like shape? Is it something to do, is this an ideal orientation shape for living in the water or is there something else? I'm also planning on using these sorts of questions to address topics around whether or not really, really baby trilobites were, were pelagic. So could they have floated around the ocean more effectively as has been proposed? And why do we see an array of really complex, crazy morphologies in horseshoe crabs during the Carboniferous and Triassic when horseshoe crabs weren't really living in the ocean, they were probably living in more sort of brackish estuarine conditions, which means that really this model, this modeling approach is going to allow us to tackle and more thoroughly understand arthropods in that marine context. All right. Finally, what if we put this all together? Okay, what if we go, okay, well, wait, we've got these three different approaches plus reconstructing. What if we build something to fully understand an animal by synthesizing this together? And I, I decided to do this because usually these sorts of models are considered effectively in, in isolation. But if we put them together, we can more thoroughly document an extinct organism. And so I've done this. I focused on probably the most iconic Cambrian animal, Anomalocaris canadensis, which is thought to have been a true apex predator. And so by using kinematics, FEA and CFD, we were able to test this idea. So first off, we start by reconstructing an animal. Now, Anomalocaris is so well documented in the Burgess Shale that we had an array of orientations for the fossils um, that we could use to build our three-dimensional model, which is what this is. In fact, this is, I think, the most accurate 3D reconstruction of this animal. And this, I, this level of accuracy allows us to really pinpoint really minute changes in the range of motion and then subsequently biomechanics of these sorts of structures. This bit was in particular was constructed within ZBrush and then I modified it within a program called Geomagic, both which are really, really good if you're trying to build three-dimensional models. Then we took our, our kinematic approach. We've got our, our, our reconstructed animal and we wanted to rotate it. But of course, we need our null models. So once again, talking about those arachnids with those really large anteriorly directed grabbing appendages, here's a couple of examples here. So we were, we were looking to see, did our anomalocaris appendage really rotate in a similar way to the way that we know that our whip spiders and our whip scorpions can do. And realistically, we, we did show that. So this degree of closure that we see or openness and closure is replicated in our anomalocaris model, telling us that the, yes, this animal did use its appendages to grab in a similar way to uh, modern whip scorpions and whip spiders. The next step was to look at these two extreme ends of our model. So the outstretched and the enrolled condition, and then build that biomechanical model. In this case, what I had done is I had built an array of different muscles here based on uh, sea spiders. So we don't know what anomalocaris muscles look like. It's one of the main limitations when we're trying to apply these sorts of methods to anything in the fossil record. But we can look at modern animals and say, how do you use your appendages? And sea spiders have this really uh, funky 
adaptation where some of their appendages are used to effectively grab and enroll in a similar way, not for predation, but for holding eggs of all things. And so we kind of figured that given that the appendages are structurally very similar and, and the potomeres, the different sections are kind of built the same, that the array of muscles we proposed here probably actually made sense. And this allowed us to see that there are a lot of areas of high strain, especially at these points, at the, the spikes. That tells us that, well, when this animal was grabbing something, it probably would have experienced some pretty high stress and strain at the tips of these spines. Then we took three different conditions, so fully outstretched, partly enrolled and completely enrolled, and placed this animal in that virtual flume tank that I mentioned before. And this allowed us to understand that the most fluid dynamic orientation for the appendages was completely outstretched. So this animal probably would have been outstretching its appendages to attack, enrolling uh, um, the appendage around a prey, and then decelerating after that. And so with this combination of aspects, we can really fully understand how Anomalocaris was functioning as a predator. So we know, we've demonstrated that it was using its appendages like modern analogs. It was grabbing with these appendages, but it would have experienced a lot of stress or strain during that action. And so it probably was not, or almost definitely was not using these appendages to crush shelly things. So the array of trilobite injuries that we see in the Cambrian probably was not made by a normal carus. It was more likely that this animal was swimming around in the water column and targeting the large diversity of soft prey that were also swimming around the water column. And so what we can say here by combining those three methods is while this animal was not probably very good at actually tackling biomineralized prey, it was a still a very effective predator within the water column. And so really this has allowed us to more fully understand and conceptualize how arthropods in, in the context of predation actually functioned in that bigger picture. Okay, well, that's um, the end of my talk. I think it's about 33-ish minutes. Um, before I move on, I just want to thank, there's an array of people I need to thank because this work is not done by one person. This is work that's done by an array of brilliant academics. Um, so I also want to thank, thank Paleo Perks for supporting this. This is such a great initiative and it's my honor and it's a pleasure to present to you today. There are so many institutions across the world that supported me, uh, either financially or in terms of access to material, or just being able to talk about the sorts of stuff. And there are numerous more colleagues with whom I've had these sorts of discussions, of which I think at least there are two people here who I've co-authored my work with. So it's, it's my pleasure to have worked and discussed these sorts of topics with these people. So thank you very much all yourselves for attending. And uh, I think we now have time for questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Russell, for that um, great talk. And yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. And we do have questions that we already have. Um, so I'm going to start by asking the first one, and then I will also yeah. place it in the Zoom chat. The first question comes uh, from Sender, who asks, how do you choose between either a phylogenetic analog and a functional analog while selecting a model organism for finite element analysis? For example, how would you choose between a horseshoe crab and a normal anoran crab while preparing a FEA for eurypteride clause? Okay, this is a really good question. Um, partly, Sometimes you're, you're limited by what we have in the modern day. So I had a very similar question when I was working on, on trilobites and horseshoe crabs is why didn't I use copepods? They also have nath bases. Well, um, copepods are a lot smaller than, than horseshoe crabs. So we're, we're limited by the scope of what makes sense in that context. So in that case, it's, it's functional morphology. Uh, in the case of looking at crabs versus uh, chelicerates, that was a phylogenetic and functional morphological choice together. So we want to look at animals that are pretty close or as close to our uh, fossil groups in terms of their, their phylogenetic bracketing. Um, but also we can make the, the assumption given the way that we think that chelic um, sea scorpions use their chelicerae, that it probably was closer to how scorpions use their pincers than how crabs um, use their structures. It also also comes down to, I suppose, the way in which 
how the, the biology of the animals we're talking about. Um, finally, there's a material property aspect here that I didn't really go into because that's getting into the nitty gritty, but crabs have a very reinforced exoskeleton that we absolutely do not see in our sea scorpions. And so if we were to compare our crabs to our sea scorpions, the models themselves for crabs would show a lot lower stress strain because they are more well reinforced. And so that comparison is then going to be uh, really impacted by that difference, which is going to influence how we interpret these models. Okay, great, thank you. We have another anonymous question that has come up. Um, in your stress strain maps, there were a lot of regions of high strain along specific parts of the Chilicre and other parts of appendages. Do you find that there is higher potential for breaking along those high stress points? And is there any signal in preservation that might indicate this? So we know that scorpions can if, if you push a scorpion hard enough, like you, you can, it will experience failure in its pincer. Um, but that being said, animals don't really tend to bite or pinch as hard as they possibly can, because that tends to result in some degree of pain and things don't like being in pain. So we can use our models to get an idea of where we may experience failure, but we are limited by the fact that these are models at the end of the day. So we can suggest, yeah, I mean, maybe um, it would experience this failure here, but we don't know for certain. Now, in the fossil record, to my knowledge, I have not seen any indication of these sorts of areas of failure, um, but also the majority of the animals that we looked at, at least from the sea scorpions, uh, there aren't that many chillus ray that have been preserved. So while they're really important taxonomically, because of that requirement for soft body preservation, we don't see a ton of them in the fossil record, which contrasts them like anomalocaris, in which we have like a, a lot of material from the Burgess shale. So possibly is the answer to that question, but there's not enough material for us to really kind of determine that and ground truth that idea. Great, thank you for answering. We have another question by Sender that I've also dropped in the Zoom chat. Have you tried plotting the FEA data with a morpho space concerning the group on which the FE is conducted? In this case with the tyrogotids and a step further, would incorporating the phylo morpho space be of importance and help answer questions relating to the ecological position a group occupies? Yes is the answer to that question. And that is effectively the current frontier of my work um, in terms of expanding um, the application of FEA. So done it for scorpions. Um, and the limitation there is that the scorpion phylogeny needs to be rebuilt. Um, so I can't necessarily build a complete phylomorpho space, but I can at least look at where these animals are, I suppose, constructed or where they fall when we look at the, the geometric morph metrics of the shape of these structures. And so what it does show you is that, that there are definitely places in morpho space where certain scorpion pincer morphologies do tend to cluster. And this gives you an idea of really what that, yeah, the ecology of these sorts of animals as well. And this kind of builds on work that's also being done to understand the eco-morphotypes of scorpions in general. Uh, and longer term, I'd like to look at this uh, in crabs and also sea scorpions and any other kind of pincery like things we see in the fossil record today to really understand like why do pincers keep evolving over and over again? There must be something in the utility of these structures. And I think we can really explore that by building these sorts of phytomorphic spaces. The answer is yes. Um, and we just watch the space for the next three years while I build a ton of models and we'll see. Great, yeah, there's, there's a sort of trailer for what's coming up next, right? Exactly. Yeah, um, so we have a few more questions. Um, and again, if people want to ask questions directly in the Zoom chat, um, or you can also raise your hand, please feel, feel free to do so. Um, we have an anonymous question. And the question is, does the computational fluid dynamics model allow for changes in the sediment load? That is not just a fluid, but closer to different brackish conditions, which had sediment flow. Yes, um, we can specify the density of water 
it's all the density of the fluid. So you can use CFD to like understand how birds fly. Obviously birds don't fly through water, they fly through the air. And so you can adjust your fluid to be density of air. Uh, and so yes, you can increase the density of water based on what you think a brackish environment would be. And that absolutely would be part of that consideration. Although the, the flip side of that is when you start to build in those additional aspects to your model, your model becomes harder to compare with other things. So really, whether or not you want to include that level of information is really a case by case thing. In the same way that I didn't look at crabs to understand pincers because the material properties would be markedly different, whether or not we want to start to look and include that level of density in our computational fluid dynamic models does come down to the question we're trying to address. Great. Uh, we have a question by Shannon um, that I'm dropping again in the mm -hmm. chat is, do you think that in addition to attacking soft bodied prey, some of the animals in questions might still go for hard shelled prey if the prey was already injured or if they'd scavenge um, dying ones? On a related note, can uh, models consider the effects of struggling prey versus grabbing a motionless object, which maybe can be analogous to targeting weaker individuals or scavenging? Um, so to the first part, yes, we know that when arthropods molt, they give off some kind of chemical, which is thought to be able to attract predators. And so, yeah, during a post molt stage and during that sort of redevelopment of the exoskeleton, it's very possible that these sorts of animals would have been attacking, uh, weakly biomineralized prey items. On the topic of modeling struggling prey. Kind of. Um, so this has been done for crocodiles. People have looked at uh, different angles of attack and have looked at different, I suppose, uh, conditions for biting. The hard part with this sort of animal is we, if we think about normal cars, we don't really know what the articulation with the, the head of the animal really looks like. So we already have a lot of assumptions built into our model, but to have that kind of additional aspect, you would need to have that additional part of the body, which introduces an additional array of assumptions and also introduces the question of how did this appendage move in the head socket, which we, we don't know. Uh, arthropods like trilobites are a lot easier. The appendages are in, in an array, so like modern day horseshoe crabs. And so we can make the assumption that they probably weren't able to necessarily twist uh, prey so much and it would have been a, a lesser problem in that context. So uh, yes, it, it's possible whether or not it's plausible is, is, is a different question and whether or not it's sort of worth the number of assumptions that, you know, immediately skyrocket. And we're already talking about a lot of assumptions here. Uh, that's, you know, really, you, you reach this point of, at what point are we, you know, almost making something up just for a cooler story? And I prefer to you know, err on the, the side of caution with these sorts of models that already are full of assumptions. Great, thank you for answering the question. We have one more. Um... Okay, I think I copied it twice, so I'm going to copy it <laughs> more time, so it just doesn't just, um, okay. So this question is again by Sender, and the question is, so he says, this question is a little more on the speculative side. How would you design a FEA study for some of the Vendobions, Idiocaran taxons, which lack to a major degree any modern analogs? Um, I wouldn't, to be entirely candid. Uh, FEA is one of those interesting tools where uh, once you start using it, you can almost get into the point of like, you know, everything looks like a hammer, a, a nail if you have a hammer, um, and you can use it to understand more and more animals. But for me, I've sort of come to this place of being, of really asking like, is that method actually appropriate for whatever I'm trying to do? Uh, with Ediacaran things, I mean, a so many assumptions uh, work that's done on like computational fluid dynamics of these animals. Like the method section is so long for like one paragraph of results. 
And so I, I wouldn't even really want to try and step into that realm in that context. Um, but I think beyond that, the kinds of methods that are more appropriate, there are methods like computational fluid dynamics. There are methods like three-dimensional geometric morphometrics because they are more within the realm of like understanding how the environment is impacting the animal as opposed to what the animal is doing on other things. Great. Thank you for fielding all the questions. And if anybody has more questions, we, we can take those over to tea time. And once again, thank you, Russell, for giving a fabulous talk. I will take over screen share. OK, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, again, you will find the link in the chat for the weekly feedback form. Um, in addition, you'll also find the link for nominating early career researchers. Join us next week, where we will have David Harning from the University of Colorado Boulder, and he will be talking about post-glacial Arctic shrubification as a future analog, evidence from ancient DNA records in Iceland and the North Atlantic. Up next is tea time with today's speaker. Russell is graciously taking time out to spend it with us. Um, so it will, it will be an informal conversation about the talk as well as any other questions about academic trajectories that you would like to ask. To kick things off, the question for the week is what is your favorite extinct or extinct, uh, or extant arthropod? And before we start tea time, we'll have a two minute break. So this is your time to get up, walk around, have a quick drink of water, and we will all um, reconvene in two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 